All right. So again, one of the a lot of psalms are are not very long in general, but as we've been noticing, if you've been coming for the past few weeks, uh, there's a lot of doctrine packed into these. So I'm going to try to try to get through this as quick as possible. There's a few main points that I want to kind of focus in on that's brought up here in the in Psalm six. So let's jump right in with verse number one. The Bible says, "O Lord." Rebuke me not in thine anger, neither chasten me in thy hot displeasure. Now, just this one statement alone, I want to I wanna dig in a little bit because what he's, what he's asking is, God, is God don't, don't punish me, don't rebuke me in your anger and in your hot displeasure. If we're going to receive disciplining or punishment, you don't want it coming, when, you know, especially when God is really mad or really angry at you because, as you can imagine, it's going to be that much worse if you're receiving discipline when you know, the other person is angry. And what I want to do is, obviously, he's speaking to the Lord, and he's, and he's basically he's asking God for mercy because that's what the, the next verse says is, have mercy upon me, O Lord. So there's something where he's saying, you know, I, I've done wrong, you know, God, but, but please just show me some mercy. Please don't be you know, super angry when you rebuke me and when you chasten me. And the lesson that we could learn here is actually I want to teach a lesson for parents. And even if you're not a parent right now, if you're going to be one day, it's going to be very important that you understand this concept and this truth. So keep your place here. Turn, if you would, to Proverbs chapter 23. We're going to deal a little bit on the subject of disciplining or chastening your children and what's appropriate and what's not appropriate. We have a society today that's going to tell you, you know, the, the world's philosophy is going to tell you that spankings don't work, that spankings are, are you know, destructive, they're abusive, and, and will tell you all the reasons not to do that. And what you really ought to do is sit down with your child and give them a time out or just take things away from them and that that ought to be that the way that you punish your child. And we're going to see what the Bible says. You know, the Bible, I believe the Bible has the answers to everything that we need to know to live this life. So any of the important, especially the important things, I mean, as far as how do you rear a child, God tells us how to do that. And, and there's much wisdom found in the book of Proverbs, and we're going to see what the book of Proverbs says. So if you're in Proverbs 23, the Bible says, verse number 13, withhold not correction from the child. So when a child needs to be corrected, when they need to be told that they're wrong, when they do something that is not right, the, the first thing is don't withhold correction from them. You need to instruct them. You need to tell them because, and the reason why I'm saying that is because the tendency can be, and especially those of you that don't have children yet, the, and, and even the more children you have, it becomes more of a burden as the parent to do something, to actually do something and correct a problem as opposed to ignore it and just not have to, I don't want to deal with that right now. I mean, you could have that attitude about all kinds of things, but we ought not to have that type of attitude towards our own children. We can't withhold correction from them just because it's not convenient for you. Oh, I, you don't understand. I've got this going on, this going on, I'm super busy. And you see your child doing something wrong and they need correction and just saying, well, you know, they're just going to get away with it now because I got too many other things going on. That's going to hurt your child. And, and we'll continue on here because... That's not the only, the only thing, and that's actually not completely what this is specifically talking about, because when we read the rest of the, child, what, the, rest of the verse, it's, it, that's not necessarily the motivation for not correcting a child, right? That's another motivation where people might have to not correct a child. But what it's saying here is, as withhold not correction from the child, for if thou beatest him with the rod, he shall not die. This motivation, what it's saying is, people who don't want to correct their child because they don't want to give them the spanking. They don't want to give the child the beating that they require. Now, I understand in today's language, in today's society, not just society, but just with, our, with the way we use language today, that word beat sounds very strong, right? We use that word beat like someone gets beat up. 
And when you hear about someone beating their children, you think about abuse. You think about a child getting a broken arm and a black eye and things like that. That is not what the Bible is talking about here. Okay, so the word beat, it, it is an important word. It, it is you know, an accurate word, but the way that we think of the word beat today is not the way that it's being used here today or here in, in the Bible, in the scripture. If thou beatest him with the rod, he shall not die. Thou shalt beat him with the rod and shalt deliver his soul from hell. Now, first of all, is there any question that this is teaching that we should beat our child with a rod? I mean, it, it's pretty straightforward and pretty obvious. It says what it says. To try to say otherwise is just to, to, to ignore what the clear scripture and to want to try to make God's word say something that it doesn't. And by the way, we do beat our children with the rod because we're trying to follow the scriptural example. But what we don't do is we don't injure our children. We don't, uh, um, you know, beat them in the way that, that someone might think would be synonymous with just child abuse where you're, where you're breaking limbs and, and just causing all kinds of, you know, whatever. God has, has equipped the human body with a padded area of their body that is, that is designed to receive instruction from. And it's, it's an area of our body that has nerve endings to it, but it's also padded enough to not cause any serious injury when something comes into contact there. And of course, I'm talking about our rear ends. And it's something that, you know, th th this shouldn't be such a difficult concept to grasp. I mean, Human beings have been around for a long time. This form of discipline has been around for a very long time. And we can see in the Bible here that it's saying not to withhold correction from the child and then equating that correction with beating him with the rod. Now, you can say, well, why, why do you have to use a rod or why use a rod? There's, there's multiple reasons for this, but one is that when you use your, your hand versus a rod, or, or, um, the impact is... is felt different ways. So like with, with your hand, in order to get the, because the, the whole point of the beating or the spanking, whatever you want to call it, is to inflict a level of pain, right? Because that's the whole purpose of it. You, you want it to sting. You want there to be an association in the child's mind that you did wrong. And as a result of you doing wrong, there's a consequence that doesn't feel very good to get them not to do that again. Because if you just use language and just say, well, you're not supposed to do that and explain why, that's a good thing. We should, we should tell them why and instruct and, and give them all the reasons so they're not just wondering what they did wrong. It's very clear. But that is not all you do because if all they ever do is just get this little talking to, that's not very motivating to not do it again. And you can look at all of the, the way that God deals with, you know, with crime and with punishment, all of them are going to sting a little bit, right? When they get older, when, when, it, when someone becomes an adult and they're, and they're being dealt with by the law of, you know, when you steal something, you have to pay back, you know, fourfold or fivefold or sevenfold, depending on what it is that, you, that you've stolen. Or if you, you injure someone else, then guess what? You're going to be injured. You know, there's, there's going to be, you know, maybe a beating coming on you. There's all these different punishments that go along with your crime that uh, God says are just. And, and um, the, all of those punishments are designed so that a person doesn't do those things and definitely doesn't want to do them again because they didn't like what they went through the first time. And it's the same way with a child. We, want, we need to, um, to not withhold correction and see in this context, not withholding correction is because it's not a pleasant thing to do. It's not fun. So like I don't derive some form of, you know, there's just this, this sick pleasure from like inflicting pain on my children. I actually would rather not do it. It's not something that's, that's you know, comfortable, and especially with, with newer parents just kind of starting, starting out. I mean, you love your child, right? You love them so much. You're like, oh, I don't want them to have any pain. I want everything to be great for them. But if you truly love them, you're going to have to administer the discipline so that they know there's, a, there's results for their, con there's consequences for their actions. 
I had a, a friend, I, I brought this up just recently in a sermon, but I'll bring it up again tonight just because it's so applicable, that, you know, his, his brother was a firefighter, and he knew a lot of people in town, and the, and the cops knew who he was and everything like this, but he continued to get into trouble and trouble and trouble. He get pulled over for drunk driving. One night he got drunk, pulled over for drunk driving three times in the same night, and the cops just kept returning him home, and he never got consequences for his actions. And this is when we were like teenagers, Okay, mind you, drinking underage, getting caught for DUI underage, and just being brought home again and again and again. That guy ended up just going off the deep end into all kinds of, just, just all kinds of stuff he shouldn't have been. And I'm not saying, I don't know what he would have done, but some serious punishment and discipline was necessary in order to, to, for him to understand. And you know, when you're a kid, when you're never getting that, you're never getting the discipline, you're never feeling the consequences for your actions, you continue to think, well, I could just keep getting away with this stuff and just getting more and more out of control. That was the example that he had until finally, you know, a consequence does catch up to you. But by that, you don't want it to get that, po that far to where it's just, oh man, now, you know, now he's in prison for, you know, 30 years or something, whatever, you know, like, like now it's just this extreme punishment because he didn't learn early on. And we don't want that to happen to our kids. We want our kids to learn from a very young age, hey, when you break the rules, when you do wrong, there is going to be a consequence that doesn't feel very good at all. So get this through your head now because later on, you, you'll understand when maybe you're tempted with something, when someone's trying to get you to commit some crime or to get you to do some evil with them, some wickedness, you're going to say, well, no, 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 I'm not going to do that. Because I know there's going to be a consequence for that. I'm, I, don't want, I don't even want to deal with that. I've already had enough consequences in my life from other things I've done. And I didn't like that at all. And I can only imagine how bad it'll be if I get involved in, in this or that. So this is the point. And we don't want to withhold correction. It says here, for if thou beest him with rod, he shall not die. You say, you're, like, you're not going to kill him. And if you are, then you're doing something way wrong. That's not, that's not the point at all. If you're, if, you're, if you're worried about killing your child from disciplining him, you're not doing it right. It says here, you shall not die. Thou shalt beat him with the rod and shalt deliver his soul from hell. And again, this is, this is very important. It says here, you say, well, wait a minute. What do you mean he's going to deliver his soul from hell? What are you talking about? I thought we just had to believe in Jesus to be saved. That's true. That is all we have to do. But the concept here that's being reinforced from a very young age is that concept of consequences for action. So if you grow up in a world where there are no consequences, well, these will tend to be your children that believe, or the people that believe, well, there is no hell. You grow up in a world without any consequence. Nothing bad ever happens, or you know, you're not being disciplined by a father, by an authority, by you know, bringing down that punishment. It's a lot harder to believe in this place of eternal punishment, of eternal damnation that's called hell. And just, just, and, and there's something about us just as humans from a very young age, just kind of getting that instilled in us and just, just having the, the concept of right and wrong and, and actions and reactions being just reinforced, good and bad. This is right. This is wrong. And wrong is always bad and negative is going to bring you bad results and good is going to give you blessings and good things. You know, having that reinforced more and more and more is going to make the Bible make that much more sense to a person and say, yeah, you know, there's a heaven and there's a hell. There's a good place and there's a bad place. And I know I've already done wrong. And if you grow up being disciplined for things being done wrong, it's not going to be that hard to convince someone that they're a sinner. That you've done wrong. I know, I've, growing up I've done wrong a lot. I got a lot of spankings from my parents, you know, I'd, of course. So the fact that it's saying here, you know, by, by giving him this punishment discipline, you're actually doing well and uh, in getting, in, in, for their salvation in the future. Turn, if you would, now to Proverbs chapter 13. Proverbs chapter 13. This is important because people are going to tell you not to spank your children and that, and that you shouldn't do it and that it's going to be damaging to them. But the Bible says otherwise. Now, Proverbs 23 is, is probably the most clear and just direct, you know, that's just like, you can't get around that. Proverbs 13, no, it's, it's not only in that one place. Proverbs uh, 13, verse 24, the Bible says, he that spareth his rod hateth his son. So when you, when you withhold the correction or you spare the rod, you decide to use some other method, it says if you spare the rod, you hate your son. 
Now, I know plenty of parents that would say otherwise. They would say, well, I don't spank my children, but I don't hate them. You can say that all you want, but I'm going to believe God's word. I'm just going to, I'm going to believe the Bible. I'm just going to say that, well, this is true. You know, I, you can say that. You know, people say they love Jesus all the time too. But Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. People say all day, oh, I love Jesus. But are they going out and actually following the commandments? Many, in many cases, no. But they'll say that, but it's not true. So a parent that says, well, I love my, ch my child, but I'm going to spare the rod. I'm not going to discipline him. Probably. Well, the Bible says that you hate your son. It says, but he that loveth him, chasteneth him be times. And that be times is an old word, but what it really means is just early. So it, you, you chasten them early. You, you do it before things get out of control. You, 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 you start disciplining your children from a younger age. Now, obviously, you know, God gave us brains and reason. You know, we don't discipline a six-month-old child or a two-month-old child, right? I mean, that's dumb. That's dumb. And, and that's ridiculous. And that is, you know, and, you know, I'm sure there are people out there that do things like that because they don't like the baby crying or something, but that is just insane. It's not, it's not right. When you start disciplining a child, though, because you, you do want to start early, but you want to start disciplining a child when they understand. When, first of all, when they can understand what you're telling them to do and they can respond to commands and, and they start to understand, they start to get a will and... It happens pretty young. I would say probably around close to one year old where you start to see this, and it's different with every child, you know, but where you start to see, hey, I could tell him this and I could tell him that and he, and he understands and he could actually do something that I tell him to do in a limited capacity. And then you can start to see rebellion come in where they don't want to do what you're telling them to do and they choose not to. Now, the, the level of discipline with the child, of course, is going to depend on their age. So when our child is very, very, very young and they first start to get that little bit of rebellion in them, it takes very, very, very little. <laughs> because they're little. They're, they have little bodies, you know, we, and, the, and you're not trying to injure them. So just a little, <laughs> literally, like, that's enough. On their diaper is enough. And they freak out, oh, what are you doing? You know, this is the worst thing in the world. But, but they need to be taught. And then, and then as they get older, right, as their, their bodies are growing and, and, and they're becoming stronger, you need to, to administer a little bit more. Because the whole point is what you need to do is just get the sting, get, the, get that sensation. And obviously when they're really little, you know, it's, it's going to be, you're being very, 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 very careful with them. But as they get a little bit older, they can handle more. So you give them a little bit more and, you know, the goal is to not have to discipline them because you've got them already trained by the time they get to, you know, because you're thinking, well, what should I do? What if my, what if my 16 year old is, you know, still rebelling and stuff? Should I spank? Well, yeah, you should. But if you're doing this properly, if you're doing this from a young age, be times, if you start early, then your 16 year old shouldn't be out of control to the point to where they need to be you know, bent over and given a whooping. Because that, to me, that's ridiculous. It should never get to that point. If you, and if you're doing it right from an early age, you'll, you'll notice. And then I've noticed, with, you know, my oldest is only eight, but they definitely need way less amount of discipline the older they get if you're staying on it. And... Um, now, look at Proverbs 13, 24 again, because there's another point I want to make about this verse. But it says, he that spareth his rod hateth his son, but he that loveth him chasteneth him be time. So the, the distinction being drawn here is sparing your rod, either, either not doing it at all or just putting it off and putting it off and putting it off and putting it off before finally giving the discipline versus just doing it early, just, just right away administering the chastening. And... It's better, it's way better to do the chastening early than to wait. Even if you don't completely end up sparing the rod altogether, you want to take care of it as soon as possible. For one, the kids need to learn that there's certain things, there's certain rules that, you know, you break this rule, just expect a punishment. 
It's not going to be this, oh, if you do it again, or if you do it again, or if you do it again, or if you do it again, I'm serious this time. No, really. No, I'm serious. We're gonna, you're going to, you know, and just keep putting it off. That's actually not going to do it. Even if you do end up disciplining them, you're going to be dealing with that all the time because they're going to know, hey, I can get away with this. And they, and they try to push the envelope. How far can I go? How many times can I do this before I actually might get punished? And they're just going to walk it to that line. They're smart. I mean, that's, that's what they're going to do. That's why it's important just to nip it in the bud right away. Just do it. Just, okay, they, they're, they're doing something that's, that they know better. They shouldn't be doing this. They've already been told. And they're deliberately disobeying early. Just, just give them the chastening. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes chapter, you don't have to turn there. Turn if you go to Proverbs 19. In Ecclesiastes 8.11, the Bible says, because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily. So the judgment isn't, isn't executed you know, quickly, right away. Therefore, the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. Now, this isn't necessarily talking about children, but I think it still is applicable. It's still the same mindset. And this is one of the big problems with our justice system today. You know, supposedly we have the right to a speedy and fair trial, right? Isn't that, isn't that what the Constitution says, that we're supposed to have that? But if you've ever known anyone or been involved yourself with, with lawsuit, with litigation or with crimes, it's anything but speedy. I mean, these things can drag out for years and years and years. And you think about the criminals that are in the, the justice system now, it's like, they go to court, and then it's another 60 days. Oh, we need to postpone it. It's another 90 days. And then it's just all these different things happen. And you've got years and years and years. And the people know that. You could commit a crime and still be on the streets for years and not face your punishment. And hey, in their minds, I haven't, I, I already been caught and I haven't been punished for this. So you could continue to just, just do wickedly and do evil and do this stuff. And that's why the, the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. And especially with the punishments today, I'm not going to get too far off into this, but with the punishments not even being appropriate, where there's not a death sentence, where there ought to be a death sentence, where there's not a harsher punishment, when people could get away with defiling children and they get a slap on the wrist and they spend a few years in jail or something like that, that's ridiculous. And that's going to make their hearts fully set in them to do evil because they know even if I get caught, it's not a big deal. I mean, what's the worst case scenario here? I go, to, I go to prison for a few years. So what? And even then, it's going to take how long to even get that sentence. And then you're going to be out before you know it. And that's what continues to deteriorate society. As opposed to having the proper justice, the proper judgment, have it done right away, have it done speedily, and have it done appropriately then the people can hear and fear and know and say, you know, as soon as I get caught for this, I better watch out because the justice is coming and it's going to come quickly. And it's that same mindset, though, from Ecclesiastes 8.11 that children will learn, too, because it's in the heart of man. It's, it's, it's foolishness in man, but it's the mindset that man has, naturally speaking, to just say, OK, well, if I'm getting away with this and, and nothing seems to be happening, then I'm going to keep doing until there's finally an outcome or a result. And that's why it needs to happen. So when we're disciplining our children, we want to we wanna make sure we're on top of that. And that if you have to drop whatever it is you're doing to give the discipline, do it because it's going to help them out in the long run. It's going to help you out in the long run. You actually have to deal with less problems when you deal with it just, just right away. And you do it pretty quickly. Proverbs chapter 19, verse 18. The Bible says, Chasten thy son while there is hope. That implies that there can be a point where there is no more hope. So if you're not chastening or chastising or disciplining your child early and you let things go until maybe they become a teenager and now you want to start disciplining them, well, it might be too late already. It might not work anymore because you've allowed things to go just too long and now it's just out of control. Chasten thy son while there's hope. And it says, and let not thy soul spare for his crying. Why? Because when you, when you discipline your child, when you use the rod, there's going to be crying. There ought to be crying. If there's not crying, then you're not doing that right either. 
So you know, you know, I always said with a, with a little with an infant, with someone you know around like one years old, you just do a little thing like that, and that's gonna that's gonna produce crying. Well, if you're doing the same thing on a five or six year old, there's not gonna be any crying involved. There needs to be enough of a little bit of a sting in order to get that to um, to get the the proper effect. So we don't want to and and again. It's especially with newer parents or even not parents at all. I remember when I started going to church as a single man and I would hear a, a child get a spanking. It, it bothered me. It upset me. It wasn't something I liked to hear or wanted to hear. Okay, and I'm just being honest with you. But <laughs> as we're in church and one of my children receives discipline... <laughs> I know it can make people uncomfortable. Part of that is conditioning in the way that we've been conditioned to just that, you know, you're not seeing it very often anymore. Instead, what you're seeing when you go out to the stores, a kid's throwing tantrums and screaming their head off and, and mom just trying, okay, come on, so, you know, or giving them something. Look, this is, this is not the way to raise your children. When they're being bad and when they're causing a ruckus or whatever, whatever they're doing that's being bad, don't give them a treat. Don't give them candy. Don't give them something they like because you are completely reinforcing bad behavior. Do not do that. That is why you have the children that you see when you go out in public that just throw these big fits and nothing ever happens to them. They're not getting a consequence. They don't, they're not under um, any type of fear. That they ought to be. You know, the Bible says to fear God and to keep his commandments. And you can say, well, why do I have to fear God? I'm his son, right? I'm a child. I'm a child of God. I'm born again. I'm born in his family. The Bible says it's a fearful thing to, to fall in the hands of, a, of the living God. It, it, there's, because we need to fear God because he will discipline us and punish us when we do wrong. If our heavenly father who is perfect in heaven does that, wouldn't it make sense then that an earthly father should, should behave the same way and, and, and that their children should fear him? Now, anyone who knows me and my family knows, I mean, my children love me. If you've been around us, if you've been around my house, they, they love me to death and I love them. But you know what? My children also have a fear of me too. And it's not that they just are walking on eggshells around me because dad's going to fly off the handle. That's not the type of fear I'm talking about. The type of fear that they have is the fear when they do something wrong. Because if they're not doing anything wrong, there's nothing to fear. And you know, if we're not doing anything wrong, if we're not sinning ever, then we have nothing to fear from God. There's no reason because if we're doing, but the thing is, we're not always doing everything right. right? So, so we do have to have the healthy fear of the Lord because we need to be careful that, you know, God's, God's going to punish us if we do wrong. So we, we want, we want to have that healthy respect, but it doesn't mean he doesn't love us. It doesn't mean we don't love him. It's just reality. It's just something that we need to be able to face. And it's, and it's for our own benefit. If we fear God enough to not get into sin because we're worried about what God's going to do to us. Great. Because if you get into that sin, it's going to be worse for you anyways. Even if God didn't punish you, you know, just the, the things that are laid out as sin in the Bible they have their own ramifications. They have their own negative consequences, even if God didn't get involved to begin with. You know, drunkenness. You're, you're going to destroy your body. You're going to destroy your liver. You're going to say stupid things. You're going to get into fights. You're going to do other dumb things that God doesn't even have to do anything for. You destroy your own life. Or you get involved in fornication. You get some disease. And you get involved in situations and have children with people you don't love. And, you, know, and, and you, you have these types of problems that just inherently will come along with sin. So having the proper fear of the Lord and not getting involved in those things is a good thing because we don't want that sin destroying our life anyways. It, it is a good thing. And, and my children having that fear of me, of discipline, or of, of my wife, you know, getting that discipline is a good thing because we are instructing them in the right way. So if we start from an early age telling them, hey, don't do, get into this, don't get into that, don't do this, this is bad, this is wrong. It's for their own benefit. It's for their own benefit because we love them. Because all the rules that we put in place is designed with, from our love for them to grow up right and to be good children, to be blessed, to, to be productive and, and to have a good life. 
I mean, that's, that's the whole point. We don't want them to, to turn into criminals and just, you know, whatever, because people don't love them. So anyways, let's, uh, let's go back to Psalm 6. I, want, I really wanted to make sure I, I brought that, that topic up. I mean, it's an entire sermon in and of itself, but this concept of not... Oh, so going back to Psalm 6, the reason why I was even bringing this all up, and I don't even know if I mentioned this, rebuke me not in thine anger, neither chasing me in, in thy hot displeasure. So I started off saying why it was important to even get the rod at all, to get the spankings, that, those are, that that is a biblical punishment. But, and this is why I was bringing all of this up to begin with, when you administer the punishment, the disciplining, the chastening of your child, don't do it in your hot displeasure or in your wrath. So let's say your child does something that just makes you really angry. And don't worry, they will. <laughs> they'll do something. They'll break something of yours. They'll do something that will get you angry. Do not go to, 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 to spank your child if you are like enraged or have all of this wrath because then you have the possibility of injuring your child and that is not what you want to do. You do not want to lose your temper, lose control. If you have to, you need to just wait to cool off a little bit. They still need the discipline, right? If, they, if, if there's something they did that was bad or naughty or something wrong, but you need to make sure you're in control. So that you don't forget the reason why you're disciplining them is not because you're just flying off the handle, mad. And you, man, I'm just going to give you the worst beating of your life because you're just real angry. But to, to hold off for a second and give them the appropriate level of punishment that's not influenced by your anger or your rage. That is a very important truth and understanding to have. And that's going back to this verse. That's what, what David is pleading with God. You know, God, because when God is angry and when God is full of wrath, we, we know what he can do. So he's begging for mercy. And we ought to have some mercy on our children to not discipline them, not chasten them when we might be full of wrath. Postpone it. Still, you know, if they deserve it, still give it to them, but then you can give it to them appropriately, what the right level is. So, so keep that in mind. Okay, let's keep reading here. Verse number two, the Bible says, Have mercy upon me, O Lord, for I am weak. O Lord, heal me, for my bones are vexed. My soul is also sore vexed. But thou, O Lord, how long? Return, O Lord, deliver my soul. O save me for thy mercy's sake. For in death there is no remembrance of thee. In the grave, who shall give thee thanks? So basically he's saying, you know, save me, God, have mercy on me, save me. My soul is also, I'm troubled by this. My soul is troubled. And just, just, just save me, God, deliver me. And save me for my other mercy's sake. You know, you know, help me out of this problem. You know, if, I, if I've done wrong, but, but help me out here. And he's entreating the Lord. But verse number five is, is the next place I want to spend a little bit more time on. Because this is a verse that's completely yanked out of context. Now, if we understand the context of this verse, what's he saying? He's saying, God, you know, spare me, have mercy on me, save me. Because if you kill me, because he was just talking about God not chasing him in his wrath, right? And God is fully capable of just ending a life. So he's saying, you know, please don't, don't, don't kill me. Don't take my life. Because in death, there's no remembrance of thee. In the grave, who shall give thee thanks? He's saying, I want to give glory to your name. I want to give thanks to your name. I want to bless your name. I want to do these things. But if I'm dead, how can I do those things? In the context, that makes perfect sense. But there, is, there are a few cults out there that want to take verses and isolate them and and. Out of context, we'll try to teach a doctrine that is not found in the Bible. And the doctrine I'm referring to here is what's called soul sleep. Or this idea that once a, when a person dies, that 
they basically are asleep. They're in an unconscious state, like in the ground, right? You bury your body in the ground, and that person's just asleep, and then until the resurrection, they're going to wake up, okay? The Jehovah's False Witnesses teach this, as well as the Seventh-day Adventists, and there's probably a few other groups that do, but those are the main ones. Those are the main ones that are going to teach this doctrine. And I believe both of them believe that the soul is not a separate entity, but it's actually your flesh is a living soul. And I preached an entire sermon not too long ago about that. Uh, you could find that online where I completely dismantled that argument. But um, what, they'll, what they'll say is, is exactly what I said. And they'll use a verse like this where it says, for in death there is no remembrance of this. See, when a person dies, there's just no remembrance of God. There's just no remembrance. There's, there, there's nothing going on because they're dead. And in the grave, who shall give thee thanks? Or see, and once a person dies, there's nothing. They lose just all consciousness. It's all gone. Well, when you apply this, you see, what they're doing is they're taking this verse. He's referring to his physical death. Your physical body. When your body dies, it's just an empty shell. It's just sitting there. It's kind of common sense, right? But the way that the language is being used here, this isn't a, a, a verse that you're going to turn to to give doctrine about the differences between body, soul, and spirit because it's not being covered here at all. What's being covered here is just asking for mercy to not die so that he can continue serving God and blessing his name here on earth. But they'll, they'll, they, they want to isolate it and, and be careful of this. Watch out for this, when you, especially when you go out and you're preaching the gospel and you run across a Jehovah's False Witness. If you get in a conversation with them, because they like to turn to verses like this that you're probably not very familiar with, right? Let's face it, when, when you go out and you're preaching the gospel, you're going to be using John 3.16. You're going to be using John 3.18. You're going to be going through the Romans road. You're going to be using verses that are about salvation, right? So those are the ones you're going to be most familiar with and comfortable with. And if someone wants to argue with you about those verses, no problem, right? Because you're, you, you're, you're used to it, you're comfortable with it. But then you get someone throwing out, well, what about so the turn to Psalm 6, verse number 5? And you're like, Psalm 6? Like, what do you mean, Psalm 6? And then, and then they have you read this one verse. For in death there is no remembrance of thee. Huh? See, there's no remembrance of thee. And then they want to take you and spin that down their, their line of thinking. Turn, turn, if you would, to Psalm 115. Keep your place here in Psalm 6. Turn, if you would, to Psalm 115. Because what I'm going to do is we're going to turn to a few of the passages, the, the, probably the biggest passages that they'll turn to, that they'll want to use against you. And I had this happen to me. Just someone, and I forget exactly which reference it was. We're going to go to Ecclesiastes and Psalms. I think it was this one in Ecclesiastes, but the first time that it happened to me, I was just like, what are you talking about? And they, and they go to this verse, and it, and it wasn't a verse that I'm just completely familiar with. I mean, I read the Bible a lot, but... There's, other, there's some areas you spend more time in than others, right? So it's just like, anytime someone wants to, to, you know, use one of these verses for some bizarre doctrine, always turn there, first of all. Don't ever take anyone's word for what a verse says, especially someone who's, who's trying to contradict Scripture or clear doctrine. Don't ever, well, the Bible says this. Okay, where? Let's turn there. And then if you turn there to say, oh yeah, well, it's in Psalm 6, whatever. Don't just read the one verse. Read the whole context to see what is it really saying and what is it talking about because they love to take these verses and yank them out of context. And a perfect example of this is, uh, is found in Psalm 115, verse number 17. This is a, this, I love turning this verse. The dead praise not the Lord neither any that go down into silence. See, when you're dead, you don't, you don't praise God. You don't, you know. So how are you saying that, that you know, when you, when you die, you're, you go to heaven? Because they say it's here that the dead praise not the Lord. But read the next verse. What does the next verse say? So verse 17 says, the dead praise not the Lord. And then in verse 18, it says, but we will bless the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. Praise the Lord. So what's the distinction there between the dead and the alive, the unsaved and the saved? Because if you have eternal life, 
you are alive, and if you are considered dead, like the Bible says, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them in the book of Revelation, it refers to people who are lost as being dead already. Why? Because their spirit is dead. Their spirit's dead. Just like Adam and Eve. God said, in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. And they did die. They died spiritually the day that they sinned. They didn't die physically, but they were considered dead because they were spiritually dead. The same way Psalm 115 here says, the dead praise not the Lord, neither any that go down into silence. But we will bless the Lord, he says, from this time forth and forevermore. So from here, and it means forevermore just means continuing on into eternity. How could that happen if you're asleep for 20 years or 50 years or 100 years or 1,000 years or however long it takes because they say that your sleep lasts from the time that you die physically until the time that Jesus returns. That doesn't make sense. That's not forevermore. That has a big gap in it. Uh, Ecclesiastes 9.5 is another place they like to turn. Uh, you can turn if you'd like. You're not very far from it. Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse number 5. The Bible says, For the living know not, excuse me, for the living know that they shall die, but the dead know not anything. Neither have they any more a reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. Again, another verse that they'll try to turn to to say, see, the dead don't know anything. So when you're dead, you don't know anything. You're unconscious. And that's what, this is what they like to use. What's funny, though, is that if you use their own logic in this, it wouldn't make any sense because then it says, not only it says the dead not know not anything, neither have they any more a reward. Well, the Jehovah's Witnesses believe that there's rewards in the, in the, new, in the new earth, right? And, and on this earth that there's rewards given. But, but here it says they, 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 they don't have a reward for the memory of them is forgotten. You say, well, does God forget about them? How could they be forgotten if they're going to come back one day? See, if you apply it the way that they apply it, and if you apply it that way consistently, it doesn't make any sense. It's self-contradictory. But if you understand the verse for the way it's just written, the living and the dead. People are alive on this earth, and there are people dead on this earth. And when you're dead physically, you don't say anything. You don't do anything. That's what a, a dead body is just sitting there. It's not referring to the soul. It's not referring to the spirit. This is just talking about physically in this earth. It's very easy, common language to understand. The living know that they shall die. Do we know we're going to die? Physically, yeah. That should be the first indication because if you have eternal life, you know, you're never going to die. Jesus said, you know, whosoever, whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? So if the Bible's saying here, the living know that they shall die, and Jesus says, whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die, do you believe this? If this was talking about spiritually, there would be a contradiction in the Bible. But there's not a contradiction because Jesus was talking about spiritually and this is talking about physically. We know that we're going to die one day. There's nothing wrong with me saying that. Now, my spirit is not, is not dead. My spirit's not going to die. I have eternal life. But this flesh will die. The living know that they shall die, but the dead know not anything. So when my body dies, my, you know, it's just going to be sitting here and you could try talking to me, but I'm not going to know anything if you're talking to my body. I don't know anything. Neither have they any more reward. I'm not, I'm not going to gain anything <laughs> being in the grave in reference to my body, in reference to physically me. See, I mean, it's so simple to understand. I just want to make sure we cover these a little bit. Uh, turn, if you would, to Psalm 146. It's the last place I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn to in regards to this, uh, this subject. I like to present the verses that, that they might use on you so that you could at least be somewhat familiar with them and, have, and, and already have a good answer and not have to just figure it out on the spot. Not that it's difficult to figure out when you're reading it, but what they do, and, and this is what they're usually what the cults are really good at, is getting you to look at one verse and then leading you down the path of how they want you to think about it. And that then becomes more difficult for you just to kind of see what it actually says. Because they've already plan, you know, got in your head that this is the way that you think about this verse. 
That's why it's always important just to continually get the context and just say, hold on, hold on a second, because you don't want to accept just what the way their, their understanding of it to be true. And the context will always clear things up. Psalm 146. So they'll want to look at verse number four, which says, his breath goeth forth, he returneth to his earth. In that very day his thoughts perish. Well, if his thoughts perish, then they die. I mean, then he can't have any more thoughts, right? But you, but, you know, they'll say, but you say, you know, you just go straight to heaven. Are you thinking in heaven? Do you have thoughts? Yeah, well, this says your thoughts perish. Well, let's get the context. What does it actually say? Verse number three. Sorry, in verse number three. Put not your trust in princes, nor in the son of man in whom there is no help. So he's talking about trusting in man, trusting in leaders, trusting in you know, princes or kings on this earth. His breath goeth forth, talking about the princes of the Son of Man, where there is no help. His breath goeth forth, he returneth to his earth, and that day is very, his, his thoughts perish. Happy is he that hath the God of Jacob for his help, whose hope is in the Lord his God. So the, the, the contrast there in context is trusting in man versus trusting in God. If you're trusting in a man when that man dies, he's not going to be able to help you anymore because his thoughts perish, because he's done. He can't, he can't lead you anymore. He can't guide you anymore. He's not going to do you any good when he dies. But if your trust is in the Lord, you'll always have help. You'll always have guidance. You'll always have that light. It's very simple. And again, it's talking to him physically die. Yeah, because when a person physically dies, what good am I going to do to this church as pastor when my body dies and I'm gone? I'm not going to do any good anymore. Because physically, does that mean I'm not going to have thoughts in heaven? No. But no one else is going to hear any of my thoughts and expounding on God's word here. And that's why you shouldn't trust in me or trust in a man. Trust not in the princess. Trust, you know, trust not in, in the son of man. Trust in God. But the easiest way in my opinion, because I, you don't want to get caught up in debates and, and, and just vain arguments. The Bible says, a man that is an heretic after the first and second admonition, reject. So if someone's just involved in heresy and they're heretics and they're trying to teach you something different, you still try to reach them. You give them an admonition, you tell them they're wrong and why, you show them some scripture, you give them a second chance. But you don't continue going back and forth because it's just vain. You're not going to get anywhere. You, just, you give them two chances and then you just say, okay, fine, I'm done with you. Why? Because you know what? There are people out there that will listen. And you don't want to waste all your time with someone who's not hearing. They're not being receptive. They, you can go for hours and hours and days and days and weeks and weeks and go nowhere with them when they have that type of an attitude. And especially when you can show them clear scripture. So what I do, instead of really going back and forth on these verses, I might give an answer for one of them because I don't want them to just keep on throwing you know, these various verses that we looked at at me. Because if you don't hear it the first time, any of these, these, these all are basically saying the same thing. They're, they're all, it's, it's all pretty much the same answer for each of those verses that they want to bring up when you look at them in context. But what I do is I turn to Luke 16 when, when people believe in this soul sleep and they, and they don't believe that, you know, like once you die, you're either going to go to heaven or hell. Luke 16 is the most clear example. And if they're going to reject Luke 16, then I just say, well, I don't know. You know, if you don't want to accept the Bible for what it says, because they'll just want to say, oh, Luke 16 is a parable. But this, you, you might want to mark, make note of Luke 16 if you, if you don't already know what I'm talking about. Luke 16, Jesus talks about the rich man and the beggar. And we'll read through it real quickly. Uh, sorry, in verse number 19 of Luke 16, the Bible says, There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died... The beggar died and was carried by the angels in Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell, 
he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. So right there, we have a story of two men. And the reason why, when they want to say it's a parable, I say, no, it's not, because there's actually a name given here. Lazarus. This is a real person. When Jesus, what other parable can you point to where Jesus is naming a name of a person? You're not going to find it. He's going to say a certain, you know, uh, a, a ruler or this person or that person when he's given a parable and you'll usually find in the context that he spake unto them a parable yeah. and like the Bible tells you it's a parable in this story it's first of all it's never referred to as a parable and Jesus says Lazarus like like his name is Lazarus Lazarus was this guy that was saved and when he died, he was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. You know what? That's how people get to heaven when they die. They're carried by the angels. The Bible says, No man hath ascended up into heaven, but the Son of Man, um, which is in heaven. That's John 3, uh, 15 or 14. Because we don't ascend to heaven on our own. When we die, we don't just, just like, we don't have the power to just go into heaven. We need to be taken to heaven in, in our spirit. Like the, the spirit's taken to heaven by the angels. And if we're not taken to heaven, we're going to wind up in hell. It's, um, yeah, John 3, 13, excuse me. And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, which is in heaven. Talk about Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ did ascend up to heaven. He didn't need the angels to take him into heaven. He ascended up to heaven. And he's the only one to, to be able to do that. But very clearly, you know, you show them this scripture and, you know, you give the answer for the first one they give you. Then you show them this scripture and you say, you know what, this is really clear. If you can't see that two people died and it's, it's immediately talking about where they are at that moment. And it's, again, further evidence that this isn't talking about, well, at the resurrection, this happens. Because later on, the man is talking with Abraham and he says, hey, Verse number 28, for I have five brethren that he may testify unto them lest they also come into this place of torment. That's talking about while his brothers are still alive on the earth. He wants to send Lazarus to them so that they could hear Lazarus and believe because they, he doesn't want his own family, his own brethren to be sent to hell. Obviously, this is talking about real time, not something that would happen at the resurrection. This happens right then. So, completely de debunks the soul sleep argument. But like I said, you know, if they're not willing to listen, you give them one or two admonitions and then reject. Don't waste your time on them. Keep moving forward. Let's, let's keep moving forward here in Psalm 6. Almost done. Psalm 6, I got one more point I want to make on these verses. Psalm 6, verse number 6, the Bible says, I am weary with my groaning. All the night make I my bed to swim. I water my couch with my tears. Very colorful language, very great language used here just to describe the, the sorrow and the, the amount of crying you know, David's describing here that, that I, call, I make my bed to swim. Obviously, he's not crying so much that there's actually like a literal river in his, in his room, but you get the idea. He, he has a lot of tears. He's a lot of sorrow. I water my couch with my tears. Mine eye is consumed because of grief. It waxeth old because of all mine enemies. Now, the point I want to make on this is that it's okay to have sorrow and grief in this life. And we will have sorrow and grief. Unfortunately, we live, again, in a society, in a culture where they're going to try to tell you that if you are sad, if you're depressed, if you have grief, then you, there's something wrong with you and you need to be put on these drugs to fix your problem. I'm not saying that there's never, you know, if people just completely overcome with sorrow and that's just always sad in their life, that that's okay, that that's normal. But we do need to recognize that there is grief and sorrow that is very normal. So you can't just at the drop of the hat be willing to, to medicate someone. And I don't think medication is the answer for any of it anyways. Because if someone has that much sorrow in their life just on a regular basis and they're always depressed and always sad, there's a different problem. There's an issue. It's not a problem with their mind. They have, a, they have a spiritual problem that needs to be fixed. They need to either get right with God or they need to come to know God. But that's the real reason. But we're going to see here, uh, turn if you go to Isaiah 53. 
Because Isaiah 53 says that Jesus was a man of sorrows. Jesus himself. So to have grief and sorrow in our life isn't just an automatic indicator that, oh, there's something wrong with me because I'm sad or I'm grieving or I, I, I'm depressed. In, in, did I? I said Isaiah, right? Isaiah 53? Okay, good. I want to make sure I didn't say Psalm by accident. Psalms. Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53 is a prophecy of Jesus Christ, which, as we read it, it'll become evident that, um, that that's exactly what it is. Isaiah 53, starting in verse number one, the Bible reads, Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. So it's saying, this is talking about Jesus saying, he's not like, he doesn't have all these good looks. He doesn't have this comeliness. When we see him, there's no beauty that we should desire him. He wasn't born into this world having these great physical features that people are like, oh wow, what a handsome man. That's not the way that Jesus was. So, you know, as we read through this, we, it's important to keep this in mind, who Jesus was and who he wasn't, because we, can we have a Savior that we should be able to relate to no matter what your condition is. A lot of times people get really sad, and especially younger people get really sad, because maybe there's some physical disfigurement or there's something that, that they feel doesn't make them beautiful or attractive, and that could get them really sad and grieving, but when you remember and understand, hey, Jesus Christ, the Bible says, had no beauty that we should desire him. You're in good company with Jesus Christ, with the Savior, to not have to worry about the outward appearance of, of your looks and, and not to let that bother you so much. Verse number three says, he is despised and rejected of men. And unfortunately... There's a, you know, especially, again, especially with kids, but this goes into adulthood too. People can be very mean and can oust people and reject and just, you know, for no good reasons. Or maybe it is for a physical feature or something like that. And you can be despised or rejected of men. Well, you know what? The same thing happened to Jesus. Jesus was rejected of men. He came unto his own people. As about as he came unto his own and his own received him not. Of anyone who should receive Jesus, you'd think his own people would, and they didn't. He was rejected. So, so we keep this in mind. Let's keep reading. It says, He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Obviously talking about Jesus Christ there. We can look to a Savior that, already, that, that knows grief. He's well, he's well acquainted with grief. He's a man of sorrows. There was nothing wrong with Jesus. He had grief. He had sorrow. He was rejected. He, went, he had hard times. But there's nothing wrong with him. He didn't need to be put on drugs. We may experience times where we're, we're grieving and sorrow and have sadness. And it doesn't mean there's something wrong with you. Even if there's some problem in your physical appearance on the outside, there's, that's, there's really nothing wrong with you. But one thing you can do to help you through your grief and sorrows is to remember Jesus and to remember that, that he's a Savior that conquered. He's a Savior that, that redeems. He's a Savior that actually is a winner. He's not a loser. He's a winner. He did everything right. He had grief too, but he kept in mind the, the, the outcome or the goal. And we need to be reminded of that sometimes to help us with our grief as to what our purpose on this life is. And I've said this before, and I'll say it again. It's, it's you know, one good thing that's going to help if you do struggle with grief, if you do have a lot of sadness, one of the things that will help is to take some of the focus off of yourself 
and think and focus on other people. Because when you become more consumed about serving others and helping others, the Bible says it's more blessed to give than it is to receive. And you, anyone who, is, who has done work for someone or has volunteered and has helped people out and has done something to help someone, it makes you feel good inside. It makes you feel needed. It makes you feel wanted when you can go out and you can help someone else and you focus on helping someone else with their problems and you can help someone get past some of their problems. That will automatically make you feel good inside. And the more you're able to, to, to remove the spotlight from your own self, because the more you look at yourself, you might start thinking, oh man, I have this problem and this problem and this problem. And you start just, just digging in deeper in yourself. You might become more and more and more depressed or sad or sorrowful. But when you can stop doing that and stop focusing on all your problems and say, you know, I'm going to focus on someone else's problems for a little bit. That will help you to not be quite as depressed. And what did Jesus do? He was all about serving. When he, first, when he came to this earth the first time, he was, he was a servant. He had grief. He had sorrows. But you know what got him through it? He knew what the goal was. He knew the end. And the end was love. And he, he offered himself up to be a sacrifice. You know, greater love hath no man than this, than a man lay down his life for his friends. He laid down his life because of love for us. And he knew what that was going to bring in the end. In the end, it was going to bring.